Hello and welcome to NCBI Labs. So you're very welcome to the show again today. Good to be back with you for another NCBI Labs live event. We're a man down this week, but we do have two of our regular panelists with us. We have JP Corcoran and Daniel Dunn with us. And uh, JP, I, I, I don't know, I tried last week um, mentioning Cristiano Ronaldo's name in the hope that it would give us another couple of million views on YouTube. I, I don't know, did that work by any chance? Well, you know what, upon Daniel's return, we saw that live listeners shoot right up. <laughs> It made a massive impact, just like uh, Ronaldo's return to United did on the weekend. That's it, yeah, brilliant. <laughs> Great Ronaldo. Da- I have his bank account too. <laughs> Daniel, Ronaldo scored two goals on his, his return to, to the Man United team. Has your first week been sort of, you know, just about as successful, your return back to the, the live events team? Uh, the only thing I can say is I, I probably scored a, an own goal or two. No, it <laughs> counts. <laughs> well, long may that continue. They're always entertaining for the live events. We'll hopefully have a few more own goals through, throughout this uh, live event as well, I'm sure. Great. Good to have our regular panellists back. Uh, I, I kind of, do you know, I was thinking about that um, football analogy after last week, and I was kind of thinking it's probably a little bit more like the old uh, the old RTE panel. On any time there was football on RTE, it was Bill O'Hurley and you'd have your John Giles and Eamon Dunphy and uh, Liam Brady as well. So take your pick as to which one of those you want to be, but uh, we'll be the comparative panel for the NCBI Labs live event. And of course, we have a guest with us as well this week. We have Maura Barry with us and uh, Maura is going to be joining us for the Meet to meet the Team section and she's going to be talking to us. Uh, a little bit about our main topic this week as well, technology in the workplace. So you're very welcome as well, Maura. Good to have you with us. Lovely. Thanks very much, Jude. So we'll be catching up with Maura a little bit later as we talk uh, about uh, the technology in the workplace and in just a moment on Meet the Team as well. So uh, as we said there, the main feature that we're going to discuss this time is technology in the workplace, because often it seems that people aren't maybe aware of how much can be done to to bring people with sight loss either back into employment or to help them retain employment when obstacles come up. Well, we're going to be talking about some of the technology that can help in that instance as well. And uh, if you if you want to get in touch, talk to us about some of those things, give your opinions or ask us a question, you can do that on uh, the Q&A panel on Microsoft Teams or you can uh, get in touch on labs at ncbi.ie as well. And a little bit after that, we're going to talk about probably one of the devices that we haven't talked too much about so far on the show, which probably, to be honest, does them a little bit of a disservice because they're excellent solutions in a number of situations. It's the CCTV. It's a staple in NCBI technology rooms around the country. And today we're going to give you a, a virtual demo, if you like, of a, a couple of different types of CCTV. We'll discuss the pros and cons of uh, CCTVs as well. And all that's coming up on the show today. But first of all, we're going to talk about or we're going to talk to Maura Barry from the Employment Vocation Service. We won't talk about you, Maura. I think it'll be more polite <laughs> if we talk to you. <laughs> Thanks, Jean. Thanks for having me. We'll we'll only talk about you afterwards. All right, okay. <laughs> Great stuff. Thanks for being with us, more. Tell us a little bit about uh, just how long have you been with NCBI and where are you based, more? Um, I'm based in our office in Limerick, so that covers the Midwest, so Clare, Limerick, and North Tip, and our office base is Limerick. And um, I've been with NCBI, I suppose, about fourteen years now at this stage. Oh, wow. OK, so mm. a good long time. Yeah, very good. A good spell of time now, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. And what, but what about life before NCBI then? What was kind of your background, if you like? Um, I suppose, well, I always have kind of worked with people and supporting people. The, the roles I would have had before NCBI would have been quite different. Um, I would have worked with families that were, that were at risk of homelessness. And I worked in a, a women's refuge as well for a period of time. Okay. Um, so that would have been in Cork, yeah, but I spent a bit of time in Cork. So Going there's back. kind of a common Going back a few years ago, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You've always been in something that's kind of given assistance in some way. Exactly, exactly, yeah, yeah. 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 So I suppose there are some similarities through the, the various rules, do you know? Um, yeah, 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 very good. Yeah, so tell us a little bit then about um, about your role with NCBI then. What, what would your particular role usually involve? 
And I'm part of the employment and vocational support team. Um, we're a relatively new team now, I suppose, really. We're kind of a, a, in existence about 12 months at this stage. And while NCBI would always have supported people in employment and maybe to gain employment, there wasn't a dedicated team as such. Mm. So and that has been a very positive move, I suppose, that we have a dedicated team now in terms of looking at, at, at what the needs are and, you know, how we kind of deliver on that. So I suppose there's kind of two main kind of areas that we, that we work on. We support people to retain employment. So where if a person is having difficulties in work due to a change in their vision or if they have a new vision loss, um, we work with them and the employer to find solutions. So, you know, I suppose the assessment, the kind of functional vision assessment is, is the cornerstone of your assessment, really. And along with the, the um, assistive technology assessment, so we'd very much work with, with yourselves and labs as well on that, because I suppose there's technology plays such a huge part in any role in work, yeah. you know, in, in, in these kind of, I suppose, current times. And then yeah. I suppose you'd have employing people that would be seeking employment then as well. So yes. looking at supporting people on their journey towards employment. So looking at their strengths and their skill set and maybe areas where upskilling might be required. So um, we'd work alongside yourselves at times. Um, people might link in with the National Training Centre or we might kind of link in with kind of supports in, in the community with the likes of employability or National Learning Network. So it's very mm. varied, I suppose, really. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, like, mm. generally when we've met a lot of the, the team so far on the uh, the live events, we've introduced different kind of aspects of the work that NCBI does. There is a lot of variety in it. There's some common themes, but yeah. pretty much across the board, there's always with that kind of person centred approach, you've mm. always got quite unique situations. I, I'm sure that pretty much every situation you deal with is, is unique in some way or another. There's some kind of aspect where you have to deal with it just in, in terms of exactly what, what is in front of you, if you like. Absolutely, absolutely. It's, it's very individual, I suppose, you know, you're, you're meeting the person where they're at and what their individual needs are in terms of work and also, I suppose, outside of work. Um, yeah. You know, and supporting them, I suppose, to, to retain employment or gain employment or move along that kind of that journey or pathway. Yeah. You talked about there just for a moment the um, mm. the the effect of technology in, in pretty much any work over the last however long that the pandemic has been going on for now. You kind of lose track of time, mm. don't you? But it's uh, would you say has the pandemic kind of affected a lot about the content of the, the kind of work that you deliver? Um, look, I suppose the pandemic has changed all our lives, hasn't it really? And um, but I think, you know, there are some positives from it. Uh, we would have a lot more video appointments now, I suppose, which which can be a positive interaction and they can be positive in that they can reduce travel time. And I suppose the, the challenges that people with a vision impairment have with in relation to travel and transport. So that can kind of reduce some of the, the, the difficulties for, for people in terms of accessing service. And really, I suppose what it, you know, it allows us to kind of offer a more blended approach. So while you would have still some of the face to face sessions in terms of looking at functional vision, um, maybe your face to face AT assessment, but that you also can, I suppose, follow up and do your video appointments. So I think that blended approach works really well. Yeah, very good. OK, and I think that's probably, again, it's a, an experience that's been shared by by a lot of people that that blended mm -hmm. approach definitely has its its advantages as well. Anything in particular that you're kind of focusing on at the moment, any ongoing work that you can kind of tell us about? Um, within the, the employment vocational support team, I suppose we kind of set out at the beginning of the year looking at, OK, would we do some monthly webinars? Um, I suppose it's kind of an information sharing um, for people. So. Uh, kind of looking at, at topics that are specifically related to employment. So we had taken a break um, during the summer. We had ran a few before the summer, so we looked at um, technology in the workplace kind of er very early on in the year. So I think it's good kind of, I suppose, because technology is changing so much, it's good to kind of keep that on the agenda all the time. Yeah. We looked at um, kind of some interview skills, I suppose, and prepping your CV, and I suppose the things to consider when you have vision impairment within those. And last week we had, um, we looked at the topic of disclosure. So very much looking at discussing your vision in an employment context and looking at, OK, well, how you might request accommodations and how you know what you need within that and how we can support you on that. And our next um, webinar that will be coming up is we're going to look at the area of self-employment and the various supports related to that. And I suppose we, you know, we are open to receiving feedback in relation to topics that people might want covered. So if yeah. people they can email us at employment support at ncbi.ie. 
kind of interesting just he hearing you mention some of the, the topics there, like the idea of disclosure um, and and the kind of various aspects of that and the various challenges that come along mm. with the kind of communication element of it with with an employer. I, I'd say that was quite a, an interesting, quite an enlightening subject to talk talk about as well. It was, and we we had um, two guest speakers with us, um, both who were vision impairments, and I suppose they, you know, what they offered, I suppose, in terms of that real life experience was so valuable. I suppose being able to share that, um, and it is, I suppose, like when we we looked at it, it was it's very much, I suppose, looking at a, a strategy nearly of the the why, what, how, and when you might, and yeah. having that confidence in in discussing it, and yeah. I suppose knowing what you need, and very often. When someone has a change in their vision or they've a new diagnosis, I suppose you, you've, you've the emotional side of, of dealing with that, you know, in, in life mm. in general, alongside trying to retain your, your work. And I suppose people often don't know what they need themselves. So how do you go to an employer to say when you don't know what you need yourself? You know, and employers yeah. won't know either, I suppose, you know. So I suppose we, yeah. you know, work with the person, breaking down the role that they're in, breaking down the various tasks and look at the, the variety of solutions that are there and see well what what best fits the person's needs, which I suppose gives them confidence then in going to their employer when they're requesting accommodations. Yes, yeah. Yeah, it sounds it sounds very informative. If if uh, somebody wants to link in with those webinars, um, how could they how can they do that? Yeah, they can um, send uh, an email to employment support at ncbi.ie and request to be um, sent the notifications. And um, they do go up on the website as well on NCBI website under the events section. Um, they are advertised there as well, and people can register from there as well. Ah, brilliant. Very good. Well, it's great to hear a bit about the the work you're doing. Thanks for talking to us about that more a bit. Stay with us if you don't mind, because actually, our, our, yeah, no, that'd be great because our, our main topic for the show today, as we said earlier, is is actually one that I'm sure you can you can help us with a bit because uh, we want to talk about technology in the workplace. And obviously, technology is one of the biggest en enablers for people with sight loss, and that's true of all sorts of different environments, whether it's in the home or out shopping or is the topic we want to talk about today in the workplace. Um, now, Daniel and JP will be joining our discussion at this point as well. So we'll have a, a full panel discussion here about technology in the in the workplace. But maybe a, a starting point for this um, might be just to kind of discuss a little bit some of the, the challenges. Um, do, do we have any idea of how big an issue kind of employment for, for people with sight loss actually is and the difficulties there? Are there any statistics or numbers that can tell us a bit what the situation is? Um, the, I suppose the, the numbers we have are, are old, I suppose, at this stage with mm. the, the last numbers we have are from the census in 2016. And yeah. at that stage, I suppose they were showing that 24% of people with a vision impairment are in employment. Okay. So, um, quite a low number. And I suppose that, you know, there have been some positive, I suppose, moves since, you know, in terms of the, I suppose, the percentage um, increase in the public sector. And also you've... Um, Kind of organisations set up like open doors and employers for change, which are kind of a one stop shop for employers and employees kind of on the rights and responsibilities and supports available around yeah. employment. I suppose lack of awareness is, is, is probably a big barrier. Um, yeah. And certainly yeah. that's, I suppose, we held some focus groups early on in the year, and that was one of the, the things that, that came up, you know, I suppose, a lack of awareness and, and um, of employers, and I suppose a lack of awareness that you know it might often result in an employer maybe being hesitant to employ somebody that they don't know how to support somebody so i think having resources like these available for employers yeah you know, yeah are positive absolutely yeah yeah just if we bring in the, the rest of the panel as well just from from anybody's experience is that, mm. is that the kind of biggest thing the the awareness factor or is there other elements here as well that that, that present maybe quite a bit of an obstacle for for someone with sight loss and employment um, I'd, I'd say like um, Maura, Maura probably hits the nail there right in the head when she says, you know, it is it is a, a, a lack of awareness. Um, and I suppose to, you know, what support is, what supports are out there? What can be, you know, what technology can be brought into, mm -hmm. um, you know, to help out with an employee starting starting off with a new employer? Um, employers, I suppose, will be hesitant because they're not aware that um, there are certain supports that are out there. So yeah. it does, you know, it does create this, 
you know, chicken and egg, egg situation, so to speak, you know. Yeah. Um, employers like they'll, they'll probably hold back a bit where as if they, if they had the information um, that there are supports available, they might warm to, you know, t- taking on um, new employees uh, that, you know, if, if they were aware of that and as well as to get into awareness out there and to try and get into workplaces and speak to the decision makers and let them know that the information mm. is there. They're, you know, everybody's, I suppose, time poor as well. And to, to grab somebody's attention and let them know that these supports are available is probably the biggest challenge that's, that's going, I yeah. would imagine. Yeah. Mm, and I think even within NCBI, I suppose, I think there's been, um, I suppose, very positive kind of moves. I suppose with the setup of the national employment team and also there's been two new workplace partner officers um, employed this year. So I suppose their role really, I suppose, is to be kind of a liaison with employers. Um, and I suppose, you know, trying to build up nearly a, a pool of kind of internships or, or to give people the opportunity, I suppose, to sample work and and that the, the employer would be supported, I suppose, from from NCBI also. Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's it's interesting just when we're talking about awareness and the awareness for for employers, because it kind of fits in a little bit with what you were saying about disclosure earlier as well. There's mm-hmm. an awareness on the part of the employee as well of what's of what's actually able to be done and what sort of discussions can be had. and. Yeah, awareness is such a big factor. I guess the challenges are maybe a bit different depending on what the workplace environment is like. It's kind of easy to maybe just think of an office environment, for example, and you might mm. think of technology as the solution quite easily in in an office pa- based mm. environment. But depending on the environment, I guess the challenges are different. Absolutely, I suppose, um, you know, when you look at technology and how it's impacted everyone's workplace um the, the most you know the, the, mo- the most obvious place is, is definitely the office mm-hmm. um like tech- technology over the last you know decades i suppose has transformed everything that has that that's done you know behind the scenes in an office um and even you know even into retail like you have computerized uh, stock systems you know it, it's it's really after getting into all workplaces but the most obvious one i suppose has been the office but it you know when you really actually lift the lid on how a lot of businesses operate yes. technology is is an absolute core pillar of that now so yeah. um with that it does you know it does create opportunity for someone to rather than be stuck in an office 95 Monday to friday um that they could be in a, a different work environment where um technology is is available to be used you know, to, yeah, yeah. to perform their, their their employment duties, it does open up the it does open up the scope of opportunities that are available for people now. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I think um, it's kind of easy, like you say, it's easy to kind of relate back to the the office environment. But when you think of all of the different environments that technology plays some part in, whether that technology is accessible and inclusive or not, is going to make a, a big difference to to uh, and all, all all sorts of different environments for the when you we think about the um, employment uh, factors that are involved or the difficulties and challenges maybe just moving on to some of the sort of equipment that is available and is often most helpful in the workplace what what sort of equipment is available maybe we can come over to jp if we can ask you a little bit about that yeah, well, I suppose if thinking about a the assessment process that we would we would conduct uh, day in day out the IT trainers. So at that point, we're trying different equipment. Uh, I would see a vast range of equipment that would be available that might be suited for people. So it depends on on what the work the position is of of the person. For example, if it's if it is an office environment, um, and very often you know I I would meet with for example accountants, and. Mm. It might be a case where maybe some magnification software would make it would make a huge difference to their work. One example I can think of was was recently I had with, with an accountant. He made a very good point that he was finding that obviously with accountancy or you know we're dealing a lot with spreadsheets. One of the issues he found was that he was having difficulty um, in locating the mouse pointer and cursor on the screen. So we we, we tried a Zoom text magnifier reader, uh, which worked much better for them. But interesting that he was saying that he was required to ask a colleague to come over very often to say, listen, where's the mouse pointer gone or where am I, where am I mm-hmm. going to type in this email? 
but the difference it made to have the magnification software installed and then that in place, he was able to actually do his job independently without having to rely on someone else uh, yeah. you know, to, to help him with something like that. But yeah, to answer your question, yeah, about vast range, uh, look, you look at magnification software, it could be a screen reader, and then hardware options, digital magnifiers, CCTVs, standalone readers and other devices as well. Um, I know we're going to be talking about smart uh, wearables uh, in, in, in a coming event. I yeah. recently was chatting with a uh, service user who was using um, the Orcam. Now I know the Orcam might be for everyone, but this person is working in retail and yeah. has to do a lot of uh, stock taking and labeling, etc. And the Orcam was a game changer for them. Uh, because it, it didn't didn't have to have um you have if, if it used the device online so to speak and they could use it anytime they wanted so maybe we, we know we'll cover the apps like seeing ai which is which are fantastic and would be very very helpful to people maybe there are cases for example something like an orcam to come into play as well that could be very helpful in, in the office environment yeah excellent yeah very good so yeah i was i was kind of wondering are our apps just as useful kind of in the in the workplace environment we might be thinking about mm -hmm. some of the solutions might be sort of mm -hmm. there's a bit of cost involved there might be a bigger piece but actually apps can be quite useful as well some of the even Certainly. free apps yes yeah. exactly. once they're seeing ai particularly can be very very helpful yeah yeah excellent and, and the brilliant thing about that as well is that's something that can be you know somebody already has it on their phone it's not even necessarily any particular adjustment in in the workplace it's just using it the way that they'd normally use it exactly um, yeah which is brilliant yeah. what what about some of the the different solutions that maybe might have an audio involved with it, an audio feature with it so let's say for example it's jaws or something like that and it's it's actually talking back um what would be the best sort of solution in in uh, let's say an office environment other people are around you've got something that you depend on is it just is there a particular set of headphones or types of headphones that you might use to to mm -hmm. uh, be able to get the most out of that I think, I, uh, I, yeah. Oh, sorry, Jeffy. Go on. <laughs> no, I, I think you're probably thinking along the same lines, Daniel. Probably with yeah. something like a uh, bone conductor headphones yeah. would be very useful in that, that kind of environment. Uh, so yeah. we have seen a lot of people who do use Jaws or screen reader, Jaws NVDA, trying to bone conductor headphones um, because it allows them to hear external the external environment. So if, the, if it's the office phone ringing, if it's a colleague talking, I'm asking a question. All of us creeping up in you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> over their shoulder. <laughs> all, all of the above. Um, so be able to be able to um, hear the screen reader as well as the external environment. Um, yeah. That's just one example. Like phone conductor headphones, like Apple Shocks, uh, would be very useful to some people. Uh, but there are other other options as well, like something like Apple AirPods Pro, for example. Yeah. Uh, noise cancellation, exactly transparency mode, um, that have a similar function. Um, so being able to hear external sounds as well as the screen reader. Yeah, and that 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 be particularly helpful if someone was kind of, you know, a bit, bit front facing, you know, maybe facing the public, <clears throat> and you know, maybe if they were uh, looking up sensitive records or something, you wouldn't want jaws announcement out so everybody in you know in the lobby and think of maybe you know doctors mm -hmm. waiting rooms this kind of scenario. Uh, where you wouldn't want it announced out. So you have the bone conductive headphones. It allows you to hear what Jaws is saying to you, but you're also able to interact with the with with uh, people and you know coming into the lobby or whatever. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think um it it's kind of a, a point that we've maybe made in previous live events as well, but it, it ties mm. in here very much as well. Just the idea of some of what we talk about is specialist sort of software or specialist technology, but actually some of it is off the shelf and it's just making the best use of it in these sort of situations that can be absolutely ideal. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So it's a, yeah, a great solution sometimes. Um, what about other kind of requirements? Like some of the things that we've talked about there are things that don't take up any physical space, for example. But if you're going to use, we're, we're going to be talking about CCTVs a little bit later, which is, I suppose, one of the, the devices that's often used in, in a workplace environment as well, or it's certainly well able to be used in a workplace environment. Um, how does that kind of go down usually if you if you need to have the, the space for something like that? Are there any other considerations, if you like, other than maybe cost? Is there space requirements or considerations as well? 
I, I know for, for myself, Jude, I, I, I can share one, one example of that where actually space was an issue with someone. Yeah, mm. individuals working as, as a receptionist in a very uh, busy uh, dental uh, clinic. They had access to a CCTV, but actually the desk space, desk space was an issue. Mm. So we had to explore other options. I know, as you said, we're going to be looking at CCTVs later on in the show, but they actually had to, um, at the least they were advised to explore other options, more more portable options. Um, so yeah. that, that would work better for them to to uh, take up less desk space. So, yeah, yeah I mean, that's it's, it is a good point. You know, look at some of these devices, a standalone CCTV will take up the best part of, you know, of, of, the, of the entire desk. Maybe looking at a portable option uh, could be a yeah. better solution. Yeah. In yeah. some in some cases, though, the the monitor on your CCTV, um, you can wire your desktop PC into it. So instead of having mm. two screens on your desk, that uh, CCTV becomes your computer monitor, and you can flick across. Like so, that is an option on certain models of CCTV. Again, you know, with the aim of of cutting down on that desk space being being eaten up by so many devices, and leaves your room then to throw your books and paper around. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, I think what's coming up really is, is it's a process, isn't it, of, of figuring out what will work best in each individual situation and mm. looking at the variety of, of what's available, even say in terms of magnification, um, like CCTVs, that, you know, you've, you've like, you're, like your desktop ones, and you've, is it a more portable? And it's really looking at well, what will work in, a, in an individual situation, isn't it? It's, it's kind of, yeah. I suppose, yeah, teasing out um, yeah. the various tasks that somebody has to do in a day to day basis. Yeah. Yes, so, yeah, yeah. Is it essentially, you know, getting the right tool for the job yeah. um, and, uh, you know, most of, most of the work that goes into something like that is just actually evaluating what will work here in this situation, as you say, Mara, that's probably the hardest part. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and it's, it again, it kind of comes back to, I suppose, what Mora was saying earlier as, as well about the, the kind of individual approach. Each time it's going to be a little bit different, the challenges are going to be a bit different, the environment is going to be a bit different what's needed is going to be a bit different so that the solution kind of has to has to match those different uh, elements as well when it comes to cost is there is there help available for for the cost of some of this equipment because you're not talking about i mean some of the things are are very cost effective some of the things are free free apps as we talked about there but some of them definitely aren't and might have quite a significant cost attached is there help for yeah, some of those things Within the, the private sector, um, there's the Workplace Equipment Adaptation Grant. Um, and then within the public sector, I suppose there's no kind of definite uh, funding available, but it's it's to be, I suppose, approved within their own budget or own sector, so that, that the accommodations are still to be put in place within the public sector, but there's not, they don't apply for an external grant per se. Okay, yeah. And and who would that apply to? That? For example, is that, um, if it's an employer, um, is there the responsibility on the employer to apply if, if it was somebody, how about if it's somebody um, self-employed and are they still able to avail of these grants? Is, is it kind of across yeah. the board? Should there it be is, a solution yeah. for pretty yeah. much everyone? Um, I suppose where someone is self-employed, once they're, they're registered as self-employed, they can apply for the, the technical aids grant or the workplace equipment adaptation grant as well. Yeah, OK. And um, how does that generally go down? So you might have for example one piece of equipment that's quite uh cost heavy if you like it might mm -hmm. have a, a quite a considerable expense involved is the the workplace adaptation grant generally sufficient to be able to cover ev even if there's kind of more expensive pieces required it does and i suppose the process is, is different in that the i suppose the more costly the we'll say if you're getting a, need a couple of pieces of equipment, you might need more quotes. Yes. Um, but you can, yeah, certainly apply for what, what you need, I suppose. And I suppose that's, you know, we talk about assessment, I suppose. And, and if you are making the application that you have a really thorough assessment and a, try, a chance to try out the various pieces so that what you're getting is the right fit for you. Yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. JP, I think you were mentioning earlier when we were chatting about mm -hmm. this, just the, the experience even of um, yeah. when when somebody applies for something not to feel like that's you know it's a one-stop yeah. shop and uh, this yeah. is the only chance you're ever going to get kind of thing it's exactly jude so you can uh, make multiple applications for funding through the workplace grant that uh, more has mentioned um, and as another, another point as well is that for quotations and uh, we will occasionally receive this in cbi where if the 
total cost of the equipment or software hardware is up to 700 euro. I think it's just the one quote that's required. More than that, up to 1500 euro, it's two quotes, and beyond that, it's three quotes. So occasionally, you might have to go to other sources for a quotation. Um, but yeah, you, you can make multiple applications. So my understanding is that the grant entitles you to seek funding up to, I think it's 6,300 euro, but you are not restricted to make just one application and wait a certain amount of time before making another. You can make multiple applications. So if, for example, you apply for a laptop with JAWS or a laptop with Zoom text, for example, my application software, that obviously won't reach the full quota or allowance that you're available, but that's available. So you can then wait it could be whatever amount of time, it could only be a few months and submit a second application, for example, a digital magnifier or CCTV, and that you're, you're within your rights to apply again for funding for additional equipment. Yeah, uh, I have yeah. seen it happen and it has been, this, the applicants have been successful. Uh, very good, excellent. So that's that's kind of helpful to to know that as well. And um, I, I suppose this this sort of, uh, these grants that are available, when people are aware of them, they can really make kind of a bit of a, a life changing difference to somebody to be able to retain employment or to be able to gain employment um, and to know that there is actually the the cost is covered. Um, is, is that a big part of it as well? We were talking about awareness earlier, Maura. Um, I, I guess when we're talking about obviously technology is a big part of this whole discussion, but that must be a huge element of it as well, trying to make sure that the employers are aware of this um, funding or the process, and also that the people themselves don't don't kind of feel like, okay, I can't apply for this job because I wouldn't be able to do it. It's it's the kind of knowledge that actually there is the assistance there is a huge part of it as well. It is, it is, and you know, I suppose where where it's a new vision loss or a change in vision or a new job or whatever it is, I suppose it's. You know, to know, I suppose, that the supports are there to allow you to work and work, I suppose, be able to do the job to the best of your ability. And, um, you know, I think that's, that's, what, that's why we kind of encourage people, I suppose, to come to us earlier, you know, I suppose, where you're having any sort of difficulties in, in, in work in relation to your vision to come, I suppose. And, and, you know, I suppose, through, you know, discussions and, and trial, we we'll see and you'll see, I suppose, what will be of value to you, what will allow you to continue to do your job. Do you know, um, I suppose there's other kind of types of, of grants then as well, um, where where somebody might be a new employee, there's a wage subsidy there for the employer. So I suppose very much it's, you know, for the employer, I suppose, as well, once they know the supports that are, are there. And I suppose, you know, we can support both the employer and the employee. Yes. Yeah. And I think that's kind of important as well to acknowledge that, that it's not all it's not all just related to technology. Technology is a big part of the solution, but there's so, so much else as well that's been um, looked up through the, the employment service as well and with NCBI as well. Um, are employers generally kind of pretty pretty cooperative when it comes to um, if adaptations need to be made? W once they are aware of, of what's happening uh, in terms of grants and things like that, are, are the employers generally fairly OK to, to go ahead and make those changes? What's your, your own experience? I have found, Jude, actually, that yes, by and large, they are. I have been some instances where there is, um, I suppose, a set, a set of, I suppose, a sense of urgency um, mm. around the equipment. And in those cases, I have seen, rather than wait for the application process um, itself and funding to become available, it's a case where the employer will actually just purchase the equipment for the employee outright. And, and so they have it uh, straight away. Um, yeah, so yeah. I have come across that. And That's then, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And on, on that, I have seen cases, and um, maybe the rest of the panel have as well, where um, you know, you could be waiting weeks for an application to come through and, and funding to be secured. Mm -hmm. uh, other other cases, it could be months. So it varies uh, from from location to location, location wherever the application is submitted to the local inter office. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but certainly, I have come across, and and particularly the bigger companies that they will uh, just purchase the equipment uh, for the employee, and oh, yeah, they'll, awesome. they'll have from, from from the get go. Then there's no 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 wait at all. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. That's mm, it. Kind yeah, of shows yeah. a great willingness, doesn't it? If, yeah, if it does. That's yeah, it is, yeah. 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 It, is, yeah. it does. Yeah. Yeah. And similarly, you know, I suppose, like generally, you find yeah that employers are are accommodating, and I suppose, look. 
you know, the employee has a, a valuable skill set and they want to hold on to that skill set and it's in their best yeah. interest as well to support the employee in the best way they can, do you know? Yes. Um, and I suppose that process of getting funding it, it can certainly be a, a barrier. And I suppose it's not like you, you mentioned, Jude, it's not even always about the, the equipment. I suppose there's other accommodations that might be looked at in terms of flexible working time or reduced working time or um, looking at the role, maybe a redistribution of tasks. You know, if there's some particular parts of, of the role that, that, would, um, that you could no longer do, maybe kind of a redistribution of tasks. So I suppose there's a variety of measures really that would be looked at under kind of the reasonable accommodations. Yes, yeah, very good. And I'd say just even kind of from, from your own experiences, you've probably come across a number of people who have been able to, to um, either, as we say, kind of gain employment or retain employment because of some of these provisions that are made there. It's just kind of eased the way uh, along the way and it can make a life changing difference. I know that one of the one of the experiences um, that I was thinking of was uh, I think Daniel was talking to Jennifer Helian early on in the live events. I think it was back mm -hmm. in live event 13 as far wow. as I know. And that was a great experience. Yeah, yeah, um, definitely. Um, it's well worth a listen back and on that. Um, yeah, you know, Jennifer, I think was she was on with us for half an hour, and she, yeah. you know, she gave us the whole rundown. I suppose on, on her experiences, I suppose coming out of college and getting uh, on up then to commute into Dublin and moving back then to the Midlands and getting into work then in her hometown, and then actually changed then to move from Tullamore down to uh, well to move her workplace from Tullamore to Port Leash, but still take up a, I suppose a mini commute across between the two Midlands counties and perform her or um, her day of work to the best yeah. of her ability. So yeah, it's definitely worth to listen back on that. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. as I suppose is a real life experience and example of, you know, how things can work. Yeah, definitely. And I guess you come across that on a fairly regular basis as well, Maura, um, just in terms of the, the different uh, experiences that might be out there. Certainly, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I think working from home as well, um, I suppose, has opened up maybe more options in some ways. And even, I suppose, recently um, I had someone who was who should have been office based and is now home based, but I suppose kind of was returning to work on a phase basis and given the time to train and to upskill in relation to using this technology. Uh, I had regular review and support from from his employer, I suppose, to, to ensure that that, that he felt um, that he was on track. You know, um, so that that was a very positive experience as well. Yeah, very good. Well, it's it's really good just to hear some of those experiences. And as we say, if you want to listen back to the the uh, experience of Jennifer Healy, and that was on live event thirteen, which is available on YouTube and all the the uh, podcast platforms as well. So really interesting discussion just to to talk about that and uh, to know what's out there, to know the different solutions that are available and uh, the ways that uh, somebody might be able to access that. If they, if they are kind of having questions about this, Maura, would they get in touch directly with the uh, with with your own branch of the, the NCBI service? Yeah, absolutely. Any employment related queries, please email employment support at ncbi.ie or people can also email or call the, the, um, the info line on 1853 But absolutely welcome any, any queries and we respond to people. Ah, brilliant. Very good. Good stuff. So uh, that's the, the discussion on the, the um, workplace, the technology that we can use in the workplace. We'll continue on because the next part that we're looking at uh, is actually kind of tied in very much with the technology in the workplace. We mentioned the CCTVs there and uh, we're one of the devices that's a, really a, sta a staple in terms of possible solutions uh, in, in the workplace as well as other environments, of course, is the CCTV. Now, there are a variety of different CCTVs available with many similar features, but to start us off, Let's just have a brief overview of one of the versions that well demonstrates the key features of a CCTV. JP report, recorded this demo for us earlier, so let's have a look at this overview of the Rehan IC CCTV. Hello everyone, so in this video demonstration we're going to be looking at the 22 inch IC CCTV from Rehan Electronics. So the CCTV, our closed circuit television, 
is a device that can magnify text and images onto a large display screen. It can be very useful for someone who has low vision in environments such as the workplace and education or in the home. So let's look at its key features and functions now. So this is the Rehan IC 22-inch CCCD. It has a 22-inch screen and it has an XY tray which can move left and right, up and down. And what we can do is we can lock the uh, XY tray into place by moving a lever on the bottom of the tray to the left. And at this point, we can't move the tray any longer. So it could be useful, for example, if we're filling out a form or if we're signing a check or even doing a crossword. But if we release the lever, the lever to the right again, we can move the text and images on the display screen uh, in whichever direction we choose. Look, let's look at the buttons going from left to right on the control panel. The first option here gives us the uh, is, is the, is the color contrast option. So we can move it clockwise and anti-clockwise to move from black and white to full color. But if we press the color contrast button in, we have the option to move between different uh, color contrast modes, such as, black on, so, such as white on black, black on white, green on black, yellow on black, blue on yellow, yellow on black, blue on yellow again, black on white. Moving over to the right, we have the option to decrease or increase the magnification. Magnification ranges on the Rehan IC from 2 to 74 times. And then over to the right, we have the option to adjust the brightness. So clockwise will make it more bright, and the clockwise will make it darker. The last option then on the Rehan IC is the reference line option. So we can press this button put a reference line on the screen, horizontal reference line, which might make the text easier to read for some people. We can also press this button several times to type between the reference line, content blocks, a vertical reference line, and back to content block option for easier reading. So that is the Rehan IC CCTV, a very helpful device for magnifying text and images onto a large display screen. It is very customizable, as you can see. And if you'd like to have a demonstration of this device yourself, you can contact your local IT trainer or you can email labs at ncbi.ie. Very good. So thanks for taking us through that demonstration, JP. But maybe we can just uh, check with you a little bit. What, what are some of the pros and cons of the CCTV? Uh, sure, uh, no problem at all, Jude. So, yeah, I, I know I, I know we covered the digital handheld magnifiers in a previous show, so I thought it would be a good, uh, good opportunity to showcase some of the uh, CCTVs today. Um, mm. The pros and cons, I, I would say there's like three or four pros that come to mind straight away would be the large display screen. So the, the device that we had a look at there was the Rian IC 22 inch, a 22 inch screen. They generally look up to about 24 inches CCTVs. Um, and the big, big advantage is, is, is that the you know, big, bigger screen that the portable devices don't have. Looking at the handheld devices, you look at that Lucky 10 will be as big as you're going to go with a handheld device, a 10-inch yeah. screen. Uh, second advantage, I would say they're highly customizable. So as we saw in the video, the magnification ranges from 2 to 75 times on the Rehan IC. And there's also to be between 10 to 15 color contrast modes and most CCTVs. There's the option to, for example, insert reference lines, uh, other options as well, like speech, which we will have a look at in the second video. It's also yeah. possible to write on a document as well while it's magnified. So, for example, if you're filling out an application form in work or um, uh, reading a book, um, filling out a notebook, or annotating something, for example, even signing a check, uh, you can do that with, with this device, albeit maybe with a little bit of practice. It's not, not that straightforward. Uh, the, 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 the cons though, then you'd have been looking at some of the, the downsides of these devices and um, they're not they're not portable. Um, you know, you're not going to bring in one of these devices from what room to room or around an office environment because they're about 15 to 20 kilos. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, um, it, they, that, that's what most of them. There are other, other more uh, light, more portable <coughs> devices. Um, also, it can be, I would find some people as well would might find this, if it's a case you're reading a book or a magazine or some some hard copy documents, when you're starting to increase the magnification range to, for example, four or five times, your field of view is very limited. It's going to be quite time consuming to read a significant amounts of text with these devices with higher levels of magnification. So they're not going to work for everyone. Uh, some people might 
uh, one speech uh, output instead of multiplication, um, but certainly worth exploring. It could be very helpful to, to a lot of people in, in office environments. Yes, yeah. And just that field um, of view part um, of it, I suppose, is one to keep a, an eye on as well, isn't it? Because it's like it's a little bit like looking through a letterbox, I suppose. Yeah. If somebody is distant, then you'll see the, the full person standing yeah. there. Um, yeah. But if they move up closer, you're only going to see a little bit. So it's yeah. kind of it's important to bear that in mind when you when you are. Yeah, fine. Yeah, that, that's very true. I'll, I'll be interested to get other people's thoughts as well. Uh, for people who have shown, the, for example, the reason I see two, Sometimes I might just adjust the color contrast to have white text on a black background or yellow on black. Mm. And without mm. magnifying the screen, mm. that can make a significant impact on, on the person. They say, oh, it's actually much more straightforward now for me. Yeah. 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 That text. And, and, and thinking of other situations, you know, where a device like that might come into play, um, you know, like somebody who might be even self employed to do arts and crafts and things like that could take advantage of the CCTV in its colour mode, you know, yeah. maybe for getting in and doing the finer, the finer intricate bits of work that, um, you know, that, that might prove difficult without such magnification. Um, you know, even even I could imagine for some people like maybe that might get, get work re repairing a mobile phone or something, they need something um, you know, being able to a phone under there, getting small little screwdrivers, open it up and repairs loads of little functions like that. Yeah, that that yeah. device opens up, um, you know, to people and and like and it doesn't even have to be someone with with um, with with, with a visual impairment for just somebody in working with yeah. very small and tricky little pieces like that. It's, it's a it's a it's a right little device for, yes, for yeah. getting in there. You know, I'm thinking jewelers. You know, somebody mm. doing jewellery repairs at night at all. So there's plenty of scope for that device. It's interesting, there. actually. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it kind of highlights, I suppose, another one of the the pros of this kind of device because it's because it's big and it's hands free. Then you've got both hands to be kind of uh, whatever yeah. the the activity is. It's great. Yeah. I actually know some mm. some people who um, use it to knit under. Yeah, I've, I've heard something similar. I bet actually there's probably a few different experiences, sort of quite diverse experiences of how yeah. people use CCDVs. Yeah, so I think I suppose even though it's sorry, I suppose even though it's bulky in some ways, you know, and I suppose it's not portable, but it has other positives in that, yeah, you, you can work underneath it and it does allow you to be hands free when you have that space between the, the, the platform kind of and the camera. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's re it's really interesting. What we'll do is we'll we'll continue on the discussion discussion of the CCTVs in just a moment. But what happens if maybe the magnification on its own isn't quite enough? Well, oftentimes people start to think about maybe some sort of an OCR text to speech option, and there's standalone readers that can can be very useful. But actually, some CCTVs combine both the magnification and the audio in one device. JP has recorded a second demo of one such CCTV. This time it's the Rehan Acuity Speech. So let's have a look at that. Hello, everyone. So in this demonstration, we're going to be looking at the Rehan Acuity Speech 22 inch CCTV. So a CCTV or closed circuit television is a device that can magnify text and images onto a large space screen. But what if someone would want speech as well as magnification with this device? That's where the Rehan Acuity Speech can be helpful. So let's look at its key features and functions now. Okay, so now we're going to take a picture of this page and what we expect to happen is for the Rehan Acuity to convert the text to speech. The repeater dance. And he now will have to be shattered his hand, the MC said, dropping the pick. A palm to the LP that four eyes will be crackled, introducing a weighty melody to life in the fourth. So I'm going to pause uh, this here, but you can see now that the text is being converted to speech using OCR optical character recognition. There's several features that we can use while uh, the reading mode is on the screen. We can reduce speed 80%. The speech rate, increase speed 85%. The speech rate, we can increase or decrease the volume. We can pause and play the speech. We can move to the next line, next paragraph. But if we look at some of the menu options, we have the option to, for example, change the reading voice type, uh, change the audio settings. We have the option to change the display mode. So, for example, if I choose another display mode and go back to reading mode, now we have white text on a black background which might, which might make it easier to see for some people. 
Let's go back into the settings. We have the option also to uh, put a word marking on certain uh, characters and words. So for example, it could be a rectangular box around each uh, word. It could be underlining or bolding the words as they're being read out by the Reinacuity speech. Um, we have the option uh, to save and upload uh, documents to the Reinacuity. And we have the option to choose between different language uh, settings. If we want to go back into live mode on the CCTV, we take our control panel and flip it over the other way and we're suddenly back in live mode. There's two other things to point out, two other nice features with the Reinacuity speech. On the side of the device, there is a headphone jack. So if you want to have a private listening on the Regan Acuity speech, you can plug in a set of uh, headphones or earphones to that. There's also a USB port. So what you can do is insert a USB flash drive to either upload files to the Regan Acuity speech or to save files that you, have, uh, that you want to record. So that is a demonstration of the Regan Acuity speech 22 inch CCTV. It is a very useful device for someone who wants to complement magnification with speech. If you would like to arrange a demonstration of this device, you can contact your local IT trainer or you can contact labs at ncbi.ie. Very good. So thanks again for, for that, JP, and for giving us the, the two demos there of the two different types of machine. Just maybe to give mm -hmm. us a little bit of an idea of this one, JP, what, what are the benefits of having the speech and magnification together in, in one machine. Yeah, so actually the device that we looked at there has all the features of the Arena IC. The Arena Acuity speech just complements the magnification with speech. So it gives someone the option of using that OCR feature, optical character recognition, to convert the text to speech and have even word markings uh, on the screen. So as each word is being read out, uh, it's being tracked by either, either a, um, a rectangular box or underlying or even having the word in bold. So it allows a person to follow the text uh, visually as it's being read out. Um, so the word markings are a really nice feature on the reading acuity speech. Another feature that I do like in this device is it gives the option uh, for the uh, user to upload or to save uh, files as well. So you can upload a Word document, for example, you're working on work and uh, you can you can then have it read back um, on the Reading Acuity speech and you can uh, customise as well the, um, the contrast uh, scheme as well to your preferred option. But ultimately it's, it's complementing uh, the magnification with speech. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, and it's kind of interesting. Do you find that a popular option with people? Because sometimes it might be tempting to think that, um, you know, e either yeah. somebody will go for magnification. If they're yeah. able to get the most out of their eyes, they'll go for that option. And if they, yeah. they can't do that, then they'll go for audio. Um, yeah. Do you find that people like to combine the two? So what I find is I, I find it, it's almost familiarity. If a person is or has been using a CCTV with speech before, they are most likely going to go for an exact a replacement of what they've been using in the past. If they've just been using a standalone reader, like the reading IC, that's probably what they're going to use again. Um, you know, maybe after you know ten years, uh, maybe they want to, to just get replace the device, and that's usually what what will happen. Um, mm. But worth noting that this, like there are like it, they're not. I know we, we focus mainly on those two devices today to give everyone like a, a broad overview of of. The devices uh, like those through the standalone reader and the one with speech as well but there are other types as well so i mean these will vary according to the size of the screen uh the shape the weight uh, function features will be more or less the same but some might be more portable like i know for example there is a freedom scientific topaz phd which is a 12 inch screen and that folds up just like a laptop so that's something that could be taken from for example your home to your office or lecturing to lecturing yeah. It yeah. all comes into it, so it's user preference in regard to yeah. which, is, which is the most suitable. From, from what we've kind of talked about there, just even in terms of that portability there, and then mm. the two different types of CCTV mm. we've seen, is, is that largely what we're talking about when we talk about the variety? Because there's a lot of different CCTVs out yeah. there, and there is a bit of variety in, in design, but is yeah. there much more variety in terms of function than what we've seen, what we've talked I about? It's a good question. I would say with regard to function and features, broadly speaking, they're going to be more or less the same on, on all the all the different CCTVs. But you, it's interesting, you know, you you you, you might as you have someone who, who will trial 
maybe five or six even devices and um, that they'll just, they'll just like one particular device, maybe they find a slightly clearer image. Maybe it's yeah. like the way that the dials are are, are, are laid out in the screen. Um, and then maybe someone will actually want speech as well as magnification. So maybe the rehan acuity or something similar would work better for them. The price yeah. comes into it as well. The price will be uh, more uh, with the CCTVs that offer a speech option. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. OK, yeah. So, so you're kind of adding that that feature yeah. which can yeah. Um, yeah. increase the cost a bit. So if somebody wants to just kind of try out C CCTV before buying it. I think you mentioned it in one of the videos, but maybe you can let us know again yeah. how they can do that. Exactly. So we, we could demonstrate them uh, in our head office in Drumcondor, all our, our regional offices as well. So you can just get in touch with your local IT trainer or you can send an email to labs at NCBI. And we can arrange that demonstration for you. Very good. Perfect. <coughs> Thank you very much. And thanks very much to our panel for that discussion on the tech in the workplace as well as the CCTV discussion. It's been very uh, interesting just to hear about some of those. And we're we're nearly finished the, the show today. Um, we just have time for our tech help and our tech news just briefly. So we're going to go straight over to, to Daniel again. Daniel, um, probably yeah. a lot of people are used to having to accept cookies on an awful lot of websites. Any tips to kind of manage that? Yeah, the the bane of, uh, of life for many an internet surfer is yeah, accept all cookies, just give me the information, please. Um, so thankfully, there is a um, web browser plugin um, available that will kind of just click that accept all for you and uh, let you on to view the site, so you don't get that annoying pop up and you have to um, either tab around to find that accept all. A cookies button or yeah. in some cases where the website you're visiting becomes just grayed out and you have this box and you're trying to find it with its tiny little accept all button um so yeah there's a, a google chrome extension and it'll also work on the new microsoft edge it's uh, called quite apt i don't care about cookies <laughs> so if you just get to your google search engine Thankfully, you don't have to accept all cookies to do a Google search at the moment. And you type in, I don't care about cookies, and it'll be the top result that will come back uh, for you. It, it'll take you to the Chrome, Chrome, uh, that Google.com, I don't care about cookies uh, extension, where you can just tab there to add that to your extension, uh, add that extension to your Chrome or uh, Chrome or Microsoft Edge, the newer version of Microsoft Edge, it must be said. Uh, it'll automatically install that and good news for um, uh, Firefox um, users as well. If you just go down a little bit further, maybe the fourth or fifth result on the um, Google results page, you will get the extension for Firefox there also. Now, um, I, I've got uh, tried it out on one website uh, using the Chrome for uh, my Android and it seemed to have worked there as well but as ever more and more testing is required so um just I come with a health warning before I'll, I'll hand you back uh jude yeah. um it does by default if you read uh, what it says it it will take that except all cookies or in the case of whichever is easiest the minimum of cookies to proceed to view the website there are the vast majority of people seem to have no issue with the cookies uh, on, on their, you know, that are being stored by their browser. But for some people who are uh, conscious of other websites, you know, kind of yeah. tracking them through the cookies and things like that, um, it's probably not the extension for you because um, some people like to go in and refine the cookies or reject them outright. So it yes. doesn't, it doesn't get rid of the cookies box. It's just technically a little helper that clicks that accept all uh just before you even get to see the box and just let you into the into the website straight away so yeah. just uh, for anyone who's kind of a little bit conscious on 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 the old cookies and the way that that system works and uh it might not be the extension for them but for the vast majority of folks who are happy to um happy to accept cookies when they land on a website and um this you know this will speed up your browsing experience for you Brilliant. Yeah, I think that'll be uh, very helpful to a lot of people. So thanks very much for taking us through this week's tech help, Daniel. And uh, we'll go straight across to tech news. And uh, JP, what's happening in the world of Apple today? 
Yeah, so uh, we have uh, an event that's taking place uh, later on today. It's called the uh, California Streaming Event. So Apple are hosting this. Um, it's a very big launch event where it's set to unveil several new products for its uh, Apple followers. Uh, so as I mentioned, the uh, the event itself has been dubbed California Streaming to acknowledge the fact that it's been it's another uh, virtual uh, event. Uh, this was last year. Uh, it takes place at 10 a.m. Uh, in uh, Cupertino, California. So Apple HQ, which works out at 6 p.m. Uh, our time. If you want to listen uh, or watch it uh, later live, um, it will be live streamed on YouTube and on a Apple TV. Uh, just quickly, um, kind of rumors like what we can expect later. It's got th three main things. Firstly, there's a new iPhone 13s that are due to be unveiled. Um, there's very, very similar kind of lineup to the iPhone 12. So basically, yeah, you've got a 5.4 inch iPhone 13 mini, 6.1 inch iPhone 13, 6.1 inch iPhone 13 Pro, and a 6.7 inch iPhone 13 Pro Max. So very similar to the iPhone 12 lineup uh, that has already been released, people will be familiar with. Um, yeah. The iPhone 13 itself, the models are almost said to be identical to the iPhone uh, 12 models, but we're expecting a lot of new design changes. It might be a bit thicker, uh, some new colors. There's some rumors of improvements set to come to Face ID and also a bigger battery on the iPhone 13, which might result in longer battery life, but we'll have to wait and see. Uh, two other ones that we are we can, we can expect to hear about later are, will be the Air, AirPods 3. So the AirPods came out in 2016, but we have the third generation AirPods, uh, which wow. are set to be on, on bail today. And they're set to have a significant design change very similar to the AirPods Pro as what we understand, so that'll, but they'll feature shorter stems and a body that's more similar to design, uh, I say out loud, the AirPods Pro. Um, there's debate as to whether like these will have the silicon tips or not, but we'll have to wait and see, and it'll be announced later on. And there's talk as well that the year, the battery life in the AirPod 3s will be better than the than its predecessors. And then lastly, this is the Apple Watch Series 7. So Apple Watch has been around since 2015, now it's getting a redesign uh, it's going to have uh, flat edges, improvements to the battery life, and also it's supposed to have a, a blood glucose monitoring sensor. And the Apple Watch 7 will come with a Watch OS 8, which was unveiled at WWDC uh, earlier in the year. OK, very good. And uh, that's not the only event coming up, I believe. That's Right, there is another one. Uh, so two, two big tech giants, Apple and Microsoft, having two events in, in the one week. Um, so on Wednesday next week, that's the 22nd of September, Microsoft is holding a special event where it's set to unveil its latest Surface devices and discuss as well Windows 11 ahead of its expected uh, rollout on the 5th of October. So we've only, only um, a number of weeks away before Windows 11 is, is going to be uh, rolled out. Um, a lot of, uh, lot of uncertainty as to what exactly this they're going to announce, but a lot of rumors are pointing to the fact that they're going to release a several new uh, Surface devices, including a, a Surface Duo, a new Surface Book, and a new Surface Pro, and showcase all the latest software features in the new Windows 11 operating system. If you go onto the Microsoft site, you can access a link to the live event, which I did actually earlier this morning. And once you do that, it actually goes straight into your Outlook calendar if you're using Outlook. So uh, you won't miss out. It's taking place next Wednesday then, the actual event. Brilliant. And just one more piece, just closer to home, just something mm -hmm. happening with Braille as well, I believe. Yes, thanks to the reminder, Jude. I nearly forgot. Uh, so <laughs> the Braille support group and NCBI will be holding an introduction to uncontracted Braille course uh, starting later this month. So if you're interested in learning Braille, uh, it could be could be for you. Um, there, say it's 10 weeks, it'll consist of one hour session, uh, virtual uh, for a week for those 10 weeks, and then one practical session in the middle where you'll be able to uh, get your hands on and use a, a Perkins Brailler. So at the end of the course, you'll be able to read and write letters of the alphabet in Braille, as well as uh, numbers. Um, if you're interested, you can send an email to labs at NCBI. .ie if you want to register your interest. I would say the places are limited. I think, Daniel, we have about maybe five places left on, on that course, so it's in high demand. I think so, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's actually been a bit of an uptake in it. All right, indeed. Yeah, yeah so um, there's a couple of places left there. Definitely get get the email in if, you're, if you are interested in it. Yeah. Very good.
Very yes. good. Well, good to hear about that as well. And uh, thanks for taking us through our tech news this week. Good to hear what's going on in the world of technology around us and also uh, with NCBI as well. So hopefully you've enjoyed today's show. Just a, a reminder again, of course, that if you need technology assistance, you can always get support on 1800 911 110 or email labs at ncbi.ie or you can access the wider NCBI services by uh, calling 1850 33 43 53 or emailing in info at ncbi.ie. Of course, we always appreciate your support of NCBI and uh, if you'd like to make a donation to help support our services, you can do that through uh, donate.ncbi.ie. That's donate.ncbi. .ie. Just before we go, just a reminder of what we'll be talking about in future live events. A couple of the topics that we'll be talking about in some of the future ones. The Amazon show, we're uh, going to be discussing that in one of our upcoming live events and also smart glasses and uh, smart wearables. We're going to be talking about those as well. We mentioned them just briefly earlier in the show. We're going to be uh, doing a full segment on those as well. Reminder that our next show is in two weeks time, so that's Tuesday, September 28th at the usual time of 2.30. And if you want to stay up to date with what's happening on our live events, as well as plenty more, you can subscribe to our newsletter on our website, or again, you can email us at labs at ncbi.ie if you'd like to do that. So all that's left for me to do today is to thank our guest, uh, um, Maura Barry, for joining us for the whole show today, not just the Meet the Team. You're uh, Great to have you with us for the show today, Maura. Thanks very much for that. And thanks very much, Stu. Thanks for having me. And uh, of course, thanks to everyone listening in as well. And from da Daniel, JP and myself, goodbye for now. And we look forward to having you all back with us soon for another NCBI Labs live event.